Watch out, boom shot. You have to listen to this and make the way to murmur now. So this one, you have to show a shot. If you can't stop, boom shots. Boom shots. Hello everyone, please join me in welcoming reggae journalist and filmmaker Reshma B. Thank you. It's so exciting to be here today to see the screening of Babylon here in New York City 39 years after it was released in the UK. I myself was brought up in West London, partying to a lot of sound systems every year at the Notting Hill Carnival. It's so inspiring to see a film, a grassroots film, reach this level. Shout out to everyone who worked on this amazing film. You all may know him as the lead singer of Aswad. You just saw him as Blue. Everyone, please give it up for the legendary Brinsley Ford. And you remember, don't take no more of that. Yeah. Beautiful. Good evening, everyone. Well, well, Brinsley. Great, I'm enjoying the uh, US. Uh, we had a screening um, in the uh, Indiana University. I did. How did that and go? It went really well. Really well. Some really some questions. I think a lot of people they couldn't believe or they weren't sure whether the scenes that they were seeing were made up or they were real. But we had someone in the audience who grew up in England, and he assured them that no, that's how England looked in the 80s. Wow. So I mentioned, you know, it's 39 years since um, it was first released. Mm -hmm. So congratulations, first of all. Thank you. How does that make you feel? Um, it's, I think when you're doing things like this, you, you never think that 40 years later it's going to still have, uh, I think, even more of a, more of a, a, a sense of purpose. Um, because we, we just made it, we, 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 there was not parts for you know, black actors at that time. So when Martin Selman and Franco Rosso approached me and asked me to come in and read for it, um, I was really excited. You know, I'd been working as a child actor, um, so it was a great opportunity for me. You're excited because it was a well, different it was, type I, of role. I, I, I may have been an actor. I started as a child actor in, I think, 67, 67, 68. I started working with the um, Children's Film Foundation. Now, in the UK at that time, we had no children's programs on TV. So children went on Saturday mornings to the local cinema where the Children's Film Foundation made films that star children for children. Okay. So I started on a series called The Magnificent Six and a Half, uh, which was later on, I don't know, some people in the audience may remember The Double Deckers. It was shown in America. I mean, I now got two lunch boxes, which is more of an American thing than a British thing. But yes. um, we wore kids and, uh, it was basically done in, uh, in, alongside the 20th Century Fox. Okay. So it was uh, it was geared to be quite a big big situation, but uh, a lot of people in England they know me from that. Okay. So uh, in 1970, I mean, I was probably the first young black face on British TV that people saw. So you know, growing up with people have grown up with me. In it. So let's talk about the release, 30, now, almost 40 years ago, when it was released, it was given an X rating. This was one of the problems that uh, Franco and, and uh, Martin worried about, and of course the, the producer, let's not forget Gabri Glossi. Um, they thought at that time that unless Blue was seen in prison, sorry for what he had done, uh, the film would have to have an X. So there were changes in the film. I think they tried to remove a lot of Blue's anger. 
films that were, were, were shot, like for instance, the scene with the stepfather, Blue actually, uh, you know, there was a physical confrontation with the stepfather. So, you know, some scenes I think were modified and the end was modified, which is why it was left for your own discretion. Right. But years later, when there were the riots in England, mm -hmm. because even uh, the, my friend in the film that played Ronnie, while we had the read through, he didn't believe that the police would come with dogs to try and stop, uh, as he saw it, a party. He said, this could never happen. But we had to find films that showed what happened. Um, so, as I said, yeah, things were, were changed to a modified, and you were left to your own to decide what happened. But then Lord Scarman, who was the commission to, after the riots and the things that happened in the UK, uh, he watched that film to give him some idea of what it was like in the ethnic uh, situation. You know, there's you, this. The film explores mm -hmm. racial tension. You talk about the National Front. There's also, you know, immigrants. There's police brutality. You know, fast forward almost forty years later. You know, you're talking about Black Lives Matter. You're talking about the UK going through Brexit. How much has changed in almost forty years? Well, this is this is the thing. We just one incident. Incident. If you think, if you have law officers of the law that have stereotype images of a certain race of people, then things haven't changed. And here in the States, you have Black Lives Matter. Uh, I think 40 years ago, even our parents, as you saw in the film, would say these things couldn't happen, this wouldn't happen. And I think. 40 years on, people are much more aware of the things that do happen. And just at this point, I'd like to say a special thank you to Gabrielle Gotti, who was the person that helped to, to the resurgent of this film. Um, and obviously, I think he made it aware to Kinder Lobra. And uh, it was 40 years later, released in America. So can I have a big hand for Gabrielle? I know he's here somewhere. Where are you? Shout out, Gabrielle. Yeah, we met, uh, we met earlier this year in, in, in January, was it January or February? And we never imagined that we would be sitting in Portland and Kingston, Jamaica, watching this movie. So, big thank you to you, Gabrielle. I mean, the film has been held as a masterpiece with, for British cinema. Did you think all these years later, at the time when you were filming, did you think it was going to be so important. No, I think it was an opportunity for black, young black actors and some who weren't even actors and that were allowed to, to portray characters and feelings and, and humour and laughter that they actually knew and they were able to portray it on film. Um, and when you're doing things, you never think that this is going to be part of history. This is going to be, you know, we didn't think that. We just enjoyed, you know, getting up early in the morning, going to work and having a dance. Because this is what happened. And when I say having a dance, I mean, it's like what we call a, a sound system session. It's a dance or a blues dance. So if you imagine you went to work and you went into a situation that you loved. It was like a disco, if I say go to work and go into a disco. So yes, you see a small part on the screen, but it felt, so I think my mic is going, okay, there it is. It felt great, like you'd go in and music would be playing and you know, there'd be lighting and people would be dancing and singing and smoking and doing whatever. So most of us know you as the lead singer for Aswad, you know, but in he here you're, you know, Blue, who is the lion sound system guy. How much of sound, how much sound system culture were you brought up with? Well, that's how we were exposed to the music. 
it was through the sound system, right for myself, right from the time I was going to school. I had a good friend. Well, it, it starts when you see your parents having parties and, you know, I saw them on the big 78s and then a friend in school's brother, Prince, had a sound system. So, you know, I would go along and as a young person kind of trying to squeeze through this, because it was in like a dark room and, you know, people would be saying, boy, move out of the way and don't tread on my shoes or whatever. <laughs> so you kind of move through and then I had a little sound system myself and it's how we got the music. It's how, you know, that was our magazine, our newspaper. Everything was done through the music that we heard coming through that sound system because it wasn't on radio. We couldn't hear it on radio, and if there was radio, it would be late at night. Um, so that's how, you know, that was where we served our apprenticeship, listening to the sounds that were coming from Jamaica. Um, and it's, it's been great. Like, I was in Jamaica at the Culture Yard, which is where Bob Marley lived before moving to Hope Road. And the woman there that was, you know, conducting the, the kind of tour, she turned out to be Brent Dow's daughter. Oh, wow. And Brent Dow, for those who know, is, you know, you have called me, baby. Um, God, my singing voice is gone now. <laughs> but anyway, it was great to meet the family of a legend like Brent Dow. And in part, they are, you know, giving back to the music by taking people around and just to bring like the idea back of sound systems, you know, you know, obviously sound systems were a, is a big Jamaican culture, but for some reason England really held on to that and brought it to England and has still done. I mean, I, I talked about going to Nottingham Hill Carnival every year. You know, you get the Jar Shaka. You know, everyone's stringing up sound systems, but, but it's, it's a community it's, thing. It's where it's it is the culture. It, that is our culture. Um, I mean, it, it points out things on the film where you had a clash of understanding cultures. Now, you know, we would, would, would have a dance late at night because that's the only time, you know, where you could really do it. There was no clubs that you could do it. So we had our houses and, you know, people kind of, it started late. And so there you had a clash because other people, like in the community, didn't understand that. They didn't want to hear that. In fact, if I can tell a story, Franco Rosso, the director, how he got involved with sound systems, where he lived, there was a kind of a church hall at the end of his garden. And every Saturday night there would be, it was a sound system like playing. So he got angry one one day, this is the story goes, and he went down there to have a word with them, to tell them, look, my children are trying to sleep. But somehow he got in there and he just fell in love with the sound system. Obviously he fell in love with the people there. And that was Franco's uh, experience that led him to even writing about this. So uh, the sound system culture is part of our life. And I hear like it's a, somewhere not just for the latest tunes, it's also for like news, what's going on it's back a newspaper. home, it's who's a newspaper. passed yeah. away maybe, yeah. Yeah. who's doing this. It's, a, it, it, it's like the local magazine and even now even now, really, you won't hear, you know, certain music on the radio. You, you're not going to hear it. So sound systems still are the place where we hear the new sounds, where, you know, like a, the DJ or the singer is singing about an event that has happened, something that's happened, or the people's view of something that is going to happen. Um, so it still has and it still holds the place that it's our magazine, our whatever. Now, in the film, we see Blue getting harassed by the police and stuff like that. There was a thing called the Sus Law. In mm. it, I mean, it, it's 
suspicion. You could be arrested and charged because the officer suspected you were about to commit a crime. But you hadn't committed one. Well, we've seen, we saw it on the film. If that, and this is what I, when I said, if you have a lawgiver that has a stereo attitude about a race of people, I mean, I know this is an actual or factual situation. Drummy and Tony, the other two members of Aswad, had gone to the West End um, to meet some girls or were waiting for some girls. They were picked up and taken into prison. We had to go and get them out. And it was only because they were involved with island music. And so obviously it was, no, these are musicians. They're, they're, but it, it sort of happened to them. This is things, this is a fact. It's not, you know, something that's, okay, we've heard about it. This is factual. You know, Babylon has become a cult classic amongst things like The Heart of They Calm, Rockers, Shatter, but it's still such a different film to those types. What makes it so different? Well, Jamaica is Jamaica. Lifestyle is different. Uh, as in Aswad, I think our, what made us different was that we wanted to create our own music and tell our story from the British point of view. It was the life that we, we knew. And I think it shows, you can see the difference in the movie. It, it's like a snapshot of life back then in the 80s. And a lot of people who know, can I ask, is there anyone from England in the audience? One, one person. Where are you from, sir? Manchester. Manchester. So you kind of recognize, oh, I should ask you, how, how or for people here, do you recognize that as the real, okay, Manchester and, and, and London are gonna to be totally different, but do you recognize England from that? Right, okay. And I think one of the questions I was asked last night in, um, in Indiana, they weren't quite sure. They were wondering whether that was the real England or it was just created for the film. And I think that was a question that a lot of people couldn't really understand. But this is what it does. It shows you a snapshot of England from the 80s. And yes, things have changed. There's a few more buildings. Well, there seems to be more roads there. Uh, but I think you can still go into England and find these scenes. Right. You can still find it. In Manchester? It's very much the same. It was in the, in the early 80s. Yeah. You know, there's been a lot uh, for every generation. There, there has been a lot. And I mean, the last time I went to Manchester, they, it, did, it did look different to me. But I'm sure you can turn a few corners and they'll find this kind of view. And I'm sure that's what made it exciting working on this, like you mentioned. Like it was something different. It was a, a different type of role you were probably playing when you had experience of doing acting. Like you were really playing something that was familiar to you. Well, for myself, okay, yeah, because I had done things, I mean, I had done a small part in Diamonds of Forever, I, uh, Please Sir, uh, there were other, I, you know, I had been acting and doing movies, doing stage plays, and, and, but this was a real role, I mean, and then I was offered a starring role, so for me, this was fantastic. And one thing that Martin Stellman is the writer, he's, the writer, co-writer of Babylon, also of Yardi, Idris Ilba, um, asked him to help him to finish the Yardi screenplay. And the film that you may or may not have seen, The Interpreter, with, um, but my anyway, Martin said, oh, Quadrophenia, has anyone seen Quadrophenia? Okay. Um, but Martin is the writer of these uh, movies that I mentioned. Um, and he mentioned that a lot of the actors that appeared in Babylon, it, they didn't progress into doing other things. It took the generations later 
to spawn the Idris Ilders and the other actors. It was really early. It really early for its time, and um, that was one of the things that he kind of had noticed that the, most of the actors in this didn't continue. I have to say and point out, you look, you guys look pretty fresh dressed in there. Like, <laughs> you, you know, your hats, you got sheepskin coats, the swag is real. Well, did you guys have a stylist on set? No, I think. This is one of the things we we have that swagger, we have that style. We, you know, that's just how Don't we do. Don't hold back, <laughs> Yeah, no, it was. Uh, those were the things and the styles. That we were you guys doing. just came on, came to set like this, and. Well, no, obviously you obviously for the say the lead actors, they would, you know, they would have we would have wardrobe and obviously for continuity or whatever. So yeah, the lead actors would have wardrobe. But if you look at what the other guys were wearing, a lot of them just came to set and that was, that was it. So, well, this is what I got mine. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can see that. You haven't lost it yet. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, but can I, can I just interrupt just for a second? Uh, uh, can you tell the audience, you, you just directed... Produced and produced a, a, a movie for, for the BBC and Correct. you know I'd like to a big hand this is this is something that's not usually usually done and you had a half a million viewers on the first two days of broadcast we had yeah. half a million people tune into the BBC um, studio 17 the last reggae tapes available on the BBC so it hasn't reached so, here yet thank you please, so much round of applause for that thank you and I hope you'll be having a chance to see that movie right here soon thank you so much and I hope you get a chance to get it on, on the way back and that's another congratulations to Gabrielle and you guys for being able to bring it here because having made a film I know how hard it is to get grassroots films yeah. to get exposure like that this so is, it's this amazing is, this is all the problems but uh, you know it's now each film helping the other i mean at the Porty film festival we watch sprinter which is a new film that um, by storm is going to be released i believe that that will smith was executive producer wow. on that um so jamaican cinema is looking up and with producers and directors like yourself, the British cinemas looking up. <laughs> it's in good hands. <laughs> Flattery will get you everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> I mean, my last question is really about Babylon. You know, there's some, there's different meanings. Babylon has different meanings. You know, if you know it from the Bible, you recognize the Tower of Babylons and confusion. And when you watch the film, you see the Rastaman go, you know, Jamaica is the first Babylon and England is the second Babylon. What does Babylon mean to you? Babylon as in the as in the scriptures. But really it's the system that keeps us down. I mean, I think that I hear people right now we've got the Brexit and I hear people saying about this party and that party. And in reality, it's a group of people that finance both sides of the argument. But they keep us arguing or keep us from realizing the truth because we're too busy going, oh, I want this party, or no, I support that party. So Babylon, for me, just in simple terms, is the system that keeps us confused and ignorant and, and in the, that perpetual system that if we if we allow that to go on, you know, we'll just you know just 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 be in confusion every day. Put it that way.
Eli, may I dream? Peace to the eye. Rastafari, one love. So to me, it's the system that keeps us in that perpetual ignorance. So it's up to you to opt out of it. Well, I think, yeah, I think we just need to, uh, you know, it, it, it's either that of colour. I mean, Brexit, I think, is basically because the uh, Eastern Europeans were coming in. And, you know, at the end of the day, for instance, Africa, 440 billion euros France takes out of Africa every single day, and yet people are asked to give a charity to a country that is richer than most of the countries in, 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 in Europe or the Northern Hemisphere, you know, and the people are hungry, they're being used to, for, you know, to test certain medical situations that people have, you know, have created. So there, there's a lot wrong with the world. But hopefully films will bring it to the attention of people and one day we'll kind of say, okay, we need to work together to sort the problem, so. Well, 40 years later, but as the old-fashioned Jamaican saying goes, nothing before the time. Exactly. Congratulations again. I want to open up to the audience. I'm sure that people have some questions. It's not every day we're here with Brinsley. Does anyone have a question? Uh, my name is Rob Kenner, and I've been DJing in clubs around New York for many years, and I had the soundtrack album for Babylon before I ever had a chance to watch the film. So it's a treat to finally get to see the, the movie that, you know, I always knew the soundtrack to. Can you just talk a little bit about that song that I Top Lion Sound plays, the warrior charge that they get on the dub plate? And, and mash up the dance with that. That was Aswad on that track, correct? Yeah, that's a special song to me. Um, what happened? My good friend Dennis Bobble, um, known from Matumbi, he wrote the score for the film. And while we were having discussions, it was like, come on, you know, uh, my band. Why, why, why has my band had been able to play music? And I think because of the role I had in the movie, they thought, okay, well, let's... And Franco came up with the idea and he said, okay, you do the dubs for the film. And we did uh, Hey Jack Children, which is, you just hear the bass line, really, in the beginning of the movie, which you would know, but it's the one that goes, boom, 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 Boom. Doop, 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 doop. We kid, we kid, we kid. Listen, we're going to have a dance here. Yeah. Don't say it. Don't need a sound system. And, okay. What? Um, okay. We went to studio th that night um, because in, in England, most groups worked at night, which was the downtown, downtime in the studio, sorry. Um, and we came up with this vibe. Um, so we laid the track, we had the track, and the next day I had to film the scene in the garage where everyone hears the track for the first time. No one had heard this track in the garage, not even, not even the director. And I, if you see me, I'm going, I, I'm doing it in my head, I'm going... And that film, that scene was filmed without any music. Mm. So all the dancing that goes on, wow. it was just, it started... Do, 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 do. And I, we'd only made that track the night before. And when we played it for the first time in the dance sequence, Shaka heard it and came running up and said, what the is that? Anyway, I'm glad to say that Shaka took that and ended up winning competitions. You know, just like you saw in the film, we, 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 it, they're so excited having a sound system competition. Um, 
when I leave here, I'm going to go to the, the dub club because I oh, believe there's are? one, yeah, right here in Brooklyn. Where you have a, different sounds and selectors play together and it's the, the audience that decides who wins this competition. And sometimes it's not competitive, but you always have your selector that plays the music that you like. So yeah, that's how Warrior Charge was. Okay. That's how Warrior Charge was made. If it goes again, I'll okay. Come so I bet there's a lot of other questions, but I'm gonna just do one more follow up. You mentioned Shaka. I tell Lion, I think is a sound that was invented for this film, but Josh Shaka is a legendary, real UK sound. Legendary, legendary UK sound, Josh Shaka, and he's known as the international sound system. Because if you go to a Shaka dance, you'll see people that have traveled from Japan, from Indonesia, from all over to go to his dances. And I'm proud to say the young warrior, his son also now, is flying the flag and keeping, uh, keeping that alive. Very nice. And what was your sound? You said you had your own sound? I had a little sound called Ute sound back in the day. It was Did never... you have a clash? Uh, Did you have a clash? Not really, not really. I was more into music, but uh, yeah, well, you know, it's, it's, you, it's one of those things you kind of started, but you, you, know, you don't continue. All right, somebody else take this mic. Hi, my name is Angie, and I was wondering, what are some new things that you discovered about yourself after playing Blue? I think Blue is a different character to myself. Um, it's very much, it's, it's like in anything, any, I think, acting role, you kind of, it's a recall of like people you know or things that you've seen. Um, I was an actor. I had my period of kind of trying to discover who I was, what I was going to do. Um, and as I, you know, if you're a child actor, there comes a time when you, you don't really want to play a child anymore. Um, and so at that time in 19, you know, 69, 79, I moved towards playing music more, and that's why I started the group. Um, I was very fortunate in 71, 72 to, I mean, it, this was rem a remarkable situation to happen for me. I lived in a place called Neeson, and Neeson's you know, it's not far from Wembley, but it's one of those places that I would say it's like a small town. Do you right. know what I mean? It's, it's something like that. And I had been acting for years. I wasn't working at the time, so I got myself a job in a greengrocer's. And one day I was out the front and I was selling the kind of uh, the oranges and things. And I looked to my right and I swear it was like a mirage. Now, because of the sound that I told you, I had, in the old days, we used to go to the record shops and buy pre-releases, which would be tracks that would come from Jamaica that would have no labels on. And for a period, there was a, a time where you could buy different versions of tracks. And I was a great fan of the Whalers and like small acts, I think I had seven cuts, the bongo version, the dub version, this version. And I looked to the right and saw this, he was really tall, had a berry on, and around his, his neck he had a, a, a rope with a wooden fist. And as he came nearer to me, I kind of, you know, I can't even believe myself saying it. I said, but you're Peter Tosh. <laughs> and he said, Yes, I am. He walked on. As this would happen. As you know, I mean, this, this happens every day in these things. And anyway, what, what had actually happened? Bob had just signed the deal with... Yeah, I think maybe I should change. Bob had signed the deal with Jad as a writer for the then king of reggae, which was Johnny Nash. And Johnny Nash was touring England, Johnny Nash and the Sons of the Jungle. And the Whalers were booked to be the support act for Johnny Nash. Now, they had a problem with work permits and they couldn't get their work permits. 
and they were living in a house in Neasden, which now has a blue badge and it's, um, you know. So you weren't crazy, actually? No, so what happened, I, there was no, um, no musical instruments there, they just had a melodica. So I took my guitar amp and speaker and bass and stuff over to the house and I would jam and, you know, just play things. I think the first time I ever heard We Don't Need No Trouble, there was another band from England at that time called The Cimarons and we were jamming in this room and the door, Bob Marley stood at the door and I should say at this time Bob Marley wasn't dread. He wore his hearing plaits. Um, he stood at the door, he grabbed my guitar and sat on the bed because he liked the rhythm that was playing and I think that was the first time I heard No More Trouble. But, um, yeah, so my life was kind of, you know, trying to answer that question. I think my life was different to that of Blue. And I think that Blue, his life was really, he was moving more towards the Rastafarian faith. Um, but because it was concentrated in a, in, in a you know, shorter period. Um, but him and his girlfriend were, were they had been together from school and were now looking at, you know, their outlooks and their views were different. So yeah, I think my life was different to Blue. There was no, um, not that much similarities. I hope that kind of answers the question. It was long-winded, but. That's all right. <laughs> well, that good? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? There's someone here in the front. Hi, my name is Dunesca. Um, first and foremost, thank you so much for the film. And this is my first time watching it, so I was very excited to think more about, um, I guess, like blackness in another place and like how what that experience is like. Um, what I'm interested in is Ronnie. I believe that's his name, um, the white guy who was friends with everyone in the crew in like the group or whatever, um, I'm interested in his character a lot because I think especially as this film gains popularity, um, it's more susceptible to like the white gaze and just like the American white gaze, right? So what I wanna ask you is, what do you hope that American people, specifically American white people, like learn from his character and like how he related to everyone that he was friends with and like his community? Just before I start, Tedesca is a beautiful name. Oh, thanks. Thank beautiful you. Beautiful name. I actually see, and from my point of view, I see the character of Ronnie as a situation that happens to many young black kids. Mm. You're in school, you have your friends, and all of a sudden, as you get to a certain age, now, let's be honest, I'm talking back in the day, mm -hmm. okay? It's, I think it's very different now. But you would find, you know, you'd be out with, say, your, your mother or something, and you'd see a friend and you're shouting, da 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 and the, that child's mother pulls them away. Mm. So the first communication we had was in the schoolyard but you still had parents that had that racial problem. Um, I just think that it's a reverse situation, what we saw. And I think that a lot of people who, or sort of a lot of, of the white youths who would have moved around the, the black community, I believe they saw more love from the black community than maybe Ronnie did there. Mm -hmm. And I've said, I know of much more of the reverse of Ronnie's character to young black kids that, that had friends and suddenly, when it came to a, a point, were outcast. I mean, you know, I'm sure people like Rodigan and, and, and other people like that, yeah, everybody knows Dave Rodigan, right? People know Dave Rodigan here? Yeah. Okay, so Dave will tell you that, you know, he went into dances, Martin, 
Stellman will tell you he went into dances. And I think the black community are very much more loving and accepting um, of different characters. That's how we were, you know, that's, that's how it was. And I think it's the first time that you see that situation and it's like, oh wow, that's unfair, that shouldn't have happened. But I think it is the reverse of what's happened to a lot of young black kids. So that's kind of my view on it. Right, um, I agree. But I wanted to ask, what do you think that there could be to learn from that situation? Like you said, usually it's the opposite, right? So seeing that, it's just like, seeing that being portrayed, what could um, someone gain from that? Or what would you hope someone would gain from that, watching that? Well, first of all, I believe that we need to be educated. I believe that in this day and age, we still do not and are not thought the truth about what has been given to the society that we live in. I mean, we're here now, there's all these lights. We're told that it's Thomas Edison that did it, but Thomas Edison's light bulb wouldn't have worked if Lewis Latimer hadn't d discovered the carbon filament that makes the lights burn for, you know. We don't learn about that in school. So I think education is what is needed. We need to understand that there has been a lot more given to society. And I think there is a lot more, I don't want to go into it now, but there's a lot more, there's a lot more of the things that we use every day. And that has stopped a lot of young black kids having self-pride in themselves. Mm. You know, if you listen to, read the Macaulay, Macaulay gave a, 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 a speech to the British government and said, I've been through Africa, and the only way that we can ever command that place is to break the spirits of the people. So there is a lot of, of history that needs to be undone. Uh, and I don't think it's, it will come from that. It's great because now we're in conversation, conversation about it. And I think that we need to be able to speak honestly about the truths that have been hidden from us. And it's very few people that have the opportunity from, say, the black uh, minorities that can get up and stand up and say it. And people listen, but the facts are all there, you know. Thank you so much. Do we still have time for one more question? Okay. Hi. Hi. What's up? Respect, not respect, man. <laughs> and thank you for coming down. Of course, man. Of course. It's only right, you know. Um, I couldn't help, you know, but draw parallels to my experience here in, in New York and whatnot. And even though it's, like she said, like 40 years since the filming, of that movie, it's kind of mind-boggling that I feel so like connected to your character in the movie. Um, it's it's concerning to me, especially within New York, and I'd like to preference this by saying there's a great deal of awesome subcultures here in New York, but there's a lack of authenticity. And, you know, growing up in Flatbush, you know, that's Yardie's life, you know. We got Labor Day. I mean, although it pales in comparison to Nottingville Carnival, but we got that. And coming up, it was raw, just as the pictures that I saw here. You know, it was full of vitality, full of culture, full of inclusion, like you were saying. What I want to ask you is, for a brother like me, what do you think I can do to sort of bring back that authenticity? Because we have a lot of cultures out here, but a lot of them don't really, you know, have a not-for-profit sign. I think it's similar to the question from before. 
I just did it uh, three days in a, we call it prisons, you call it penitentiaries here. And my view was, I, when I, sh I should explain, we, we, I, I went in for three days to help them to create a show and we, we ended up doing a musical show. Now you have a lot of brothers sitting in penitentiaries and I said to them, there's no crime that has been committed by anyone here that hasn't been committed on the black race. You know, you, you look at Hong Kong, Hong Kong had the drugs go in, in and out. It's all been done before. But what we need to do, we need to have our self-pride to stand up and realize that we have made contributions to the society we live in and that what we have learned from society is not entirely how it is. You have been made to not have respect for yourself. We should be there teaching our, our children because they're the ones, if we start looking at the, the people who have, we mentioned Lewis Latimer, uh, Gareth Morgan, Otis Bokin, we can go through lots of people of color who have helped the society, but we don't know about them, we don't learn about them. So we have a role to play because we've been playing it all along. So I would just say educate, educate your children, educate your family, you know. The system is not set for us, it's not set for any, you know, whatever color you are. Because basically they're going to keep us ignorant and they're going to keep us fighting against each other. It's nothing to do with color because we would still be slaves if there wasn't people of another color who assisted us. So I believe that we have to educate and we have to learn and we have to have our self-pride and stand with it with other people to create a better system for how we live and for our children to come. Thanks to everyone who came out tonight. Um, thanks to you for keeping it real as always. Thank you, George. Thank you for coming out. Thank you very much.